Today's episode is about your creative space. Welcome to the Deliberate Creative Podcast, where we demystify the creative process, explain the research, and give practical advice and strategies to help you be more creative and build an innovative team. Now, here's creativity coach, team development trainer, and your host, Amy Clymer. Welcome to the Deliberate Creative Podcast, episode 103. In today's episode, we are talking about creative space and how you can design and change your space to increase your creativity. In the episode, I'm interviewing Donald Ratner, who is an architect. And at the latter half of the interview, he gives me some advice on my office. Now, many of you know that about a year ago, I built my office and designed it in a way to help me be both both more creative and more productive. Now, at the time, I didn't know Donald. In fact, his book hadn't even come out, Your My Creative Space. But uh, I was going on intuition and experience, and now I'm getting some real feedback from Donald. So Donald's going to give some feedback, and you'll be able to see in the video version of this episode, which is available on YouTube, you'll be able to see some pictures of the space. And at the very end, after the interview, uh, I make some changes and then I come back and I'll show you a piece, some of the changes that I've made, at least the easier ones. There's some that I'll, I'll, will take longer and I'll do down the road, but some of the changes were quick. It's like, yeah, why not? This makes so much sense. So I'll share those with you. In fact, all of the episodes now from episode 101 forward are both uh, audio available on your favorite podcast app, but also on YouTube as well. And so if you prefer to uh, watch on YouTube, that's always an option now. I also wanted to share a couple other little things. Uh, The first is I will be uh, giving some free webinars this spring, or this is being released into February 2020. So February, March, I'm doing some free webinars on both creativity and innovation, as well as on facilitation and training. So if you are a facilitator or a trainer and you're interested in like leveling up and learning some new skills, you might be interested in those free webinars. Or if you're interested in being more creative, which I assume you are if you're listening to this podcast, then uh, check out those free webinars. The best way to access the webinars is to join me on my email list. And you can find that at climberconsulting.com. You can sign up there. And I send out emails about once a month or so, maybe twice a month, so not too often. Uh, but you could find those, that, that's the first place that I always announce the webinars. You can also follow me on social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm on all those. You can find me at Amy Climber. So check that out if you're interested. And I'm also launching a the third cohort of the online mentoring program I have called the Deliberate Facilitator. And that will be launching in mid-March 2020. It is specifically for intermediate to advanced facilitators and trainers. It is not appropriate for novices. If you're brand new at training or facilitating, keep at it. But if you have been doing it for a while and you're at the point where you feel like, ah, and I want to I want to move up. I want to become closer to a master level facilitator trainer. That that then you're the person that this uh, mentoring program is designed for. So if you're interested in that, you can find more information on my website. But most everybody in the program ends up having a phone call with me just to make sure it's a good fit and give you a chance to ask questions. So if you're interested in that, you can email me and my email address is amy, A-M-Y, at climberconsulting.com. And we can jump on a phone call or a Zoom call and talk more about the program and you can see if you're a good fit for it. All right, today I am talking with Donald Ratner, an architect who has dug deep into the research about creative space and how our space impacts and informs our creativity. So here's Donald. Welcome to the Deliberate Creative Podcast. Thanks for being here, Donald. Hi, Amy. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about creative space, which I know is your specialty. Can you start off and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? 
Sure. I am an architect by training, uh, but I would say at this time, I'm in kind of an unusual uh, field within the larger discipline. And that is I study and teach and write about how people and organizations can boost their creativity by shaping their space according to scientific research. What type of clients do you have right now that you're doing this type of work with? I work with all sorts of folks, both individual creatives, people who work at home, writers, artists, people of that sort, and some larger organizations. Uh, currently working with a large development company that's doing a big housing development out in Texas, and I'm kind of working with them to improve their product, as we call it. So all sorts of folks. Oh, that's awesome. And you recently wrote a new book, right? Oh, there it is. Can you talk about that? <laughs> sure. So, yes, thank you for bringing that up, literally. Uh, that is My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation. Subtitle, very important, 48 Science Back Techniques, right? So what I'm writing about here is basically what I've been looking at for several years now, which is a whole pile of uh, academic scientific research investigations into what's broadly called environmental psychology, right? So that is the study of how the built or natural environments influence how we as people think, feel, and act. And what they've discovered in the course of this um, study is that um, our environment has a profound influence on our ability to think creatively and analytically as well, both sides of the brain. Mm -hmm. So what I discovered was that there's an enormous amount of material, but it's kind of hiding in plain sight. It's scattered, it's fragmented. You might find an article in the popular press, or the design press here, but a lot of stuff is sitting in scientific journals, academic journals, where other scientists look at it. But I felt that somebody needed to bring it together, aggregate it, and translate it into a way that people who aren't necessarily architects, designers, psychologists can nonetheless uh, apply it to their own physical environment. So that is what I have done and uh, very proud of the work. And I'm very pleased that I can bring it to the attention of your listeners as well. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'm excited to get into it. So we're going to talk about a few of the techniques or the strategies that you uncovered. And then we're also going to do a brief little case study of my space at the end. Cool. So let's start off. What would you say um, is one of the tips that you think is particularly important for people who are trying to be more creative? Well, the tactics to some degree tend to sort themselves out into groups. So uh, one group we could talk about are those that involve your perception of the space around you and specifically how open and expansive it is. And that doesn't mean you need to be within, you know, an enormous football field size space. It just means what's your sense of that space? Because you could be in a very large space and if there are no windows and it's low ceiling and it's very constricted, you will feel like I'm being closed in and vice versa, of course. So, uh, for example, uh, how people sit within their space is very important in our perception of the uh, surrounding environment. So a lot of folks uh, I see uh, have their desks butted up against a wall, uh, which automatically, and again, they could have an enormous space behind them, but because they're facing the wall 24 inches away, 30 inches away, their sense of space is very compressed. So mm -hmm. think about how we use language. When we say people are open-minded, open to new ideas, open to new ways of doing things, that kind of synonym of openness really does influence or is affected by our sense of environment. So if you turn that desk around, what happens? Well, you're now looking into your space and you have protection, what's called protection behind you, that wall behind you. So this touches or ties into another big uh, kind of field that unites a lot of these techniques, which is evolutionary psychology, which is how is our genetic makeup as it was formed by hundreds of thousands of years of evolution uh, impacting us today? Because the funny thing is about evolution, it moves really, really slowly which means uh, our brains, in a sense, haven't caught up to the fact that we are now spending 90% of our time indoors in built environments, mm -hmm. whereas, of course, for the first 190,000 or so years, we were in a purely natural environment, out of doors, very open, very expansive. So we find that we get all sorts of kind of weird anomalies in our thinking, in our, in our brain patterns, when we do things that conflict with how we would have survived in our natural environment. So 
in our natural environment, those who built habitats uh, that had some kind of protection from their blind spots, right, so that predators could not sneak up and eat them or throw spears at them, uh, meaning behind you, above you, and at your flanks, they survived, and therefore their genetic pool came down to us. Mm. Whereas when we have our back to a room, we feel slightly tense. As soon as we feel slightly stressed, slightly tense, however subliminally, we move into an analytical mindset, right? That left brain thinking, because it's all about how do I get out of my predicament? How do I preserve myself? And so on and so forth. So lots of complicated things going on, but that, that's just one example. So even if, like in my case right here, you can see there's a door behind me. So even if there's a door behind you, in a place that you feel completely comfortable, like your own home, there's still this like deep way back in your brain, this subliminal message saying, you're not safe. It's not okay to be creative right now. Exactly, exactly. And, and the, the point of entry into them is a, is a very important uh, aspect of your environment, whereas how can people come into your space? If you cannot see them coming into your space, then there, of course there is that possibility. Of course, not realistic today in your, in your home environment, certainly, right. but there is that concept our genetic engineering is saying, whoa, danger, danger. However, kind of below your consciousness that might be, it is there and your brain is spewing out stress hormones and all that kind of bad stuff, even though you might not be uh, literally aware of it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, actually, after reading the book and learning about that, I'm in my kitchen. I don't work a ton in my kitchen, or I should say my dining room where the table is. There's doors on either end, and I found myself being conscientious of where I sit if I'm just going to like sit down and work on something for half an hour of like, which of the four sides of the table do I sit on that would help me be most creative? And I hadn't really thought about that before reading the book, so I, I appreciate that perspective. Yeah, I even, uh, you know, I sometimes give a talk on this subject and I had a fellow come up afterwards and say, you know what, I never knew why I felt kind of uncomfortable when I sat with my back to the room. But now that I've heard your explanation, it makes total sense. Yeah. So there it is. Yeah, I love it. You mentioned a moment ago this, this idea of having an open space or at least the perception of an open space. So let's talk about that because I think many listeners uh, may not have that much control about their space. You know, they're kind of, this is the office I've been assigned or this is the space in my house. What are some things that we can do to increase that perception of openness? Right. So yes, yeah, certainly in work environments, generally one does not have complete control over uh, the space in which they are placed, but there are things you can do. And first of all, I should mention that, you know, 48 techniques doesn't mean you have to do all 48 of them to <laughs> derive benefits, psychological yeah. benefits from them. We're finding again and again that just one change in one's environment can make a, actually a very palpable and tangible difference. Nice. I've done lots of studies on that. So, okay, you know, for example, one of the tactics within this group is work under a high ceiling, uh, which according to the research, the kind of threshold is 10 feet or higher would be a high ceiling. And they found that people working under a high ceiling will be more prone to generate new and fresh ideas and so forth than people working under an eight foot ceiling. But you go, uh, well, I can't raise the roof on my home or I can't change the office structure. So what do I do? Well, there's some optical things you can do. So for example, in a home environment, you could paint vertical stripes on your wall to kind of direct the eye upwards. You could lean a tall mirror against a wall, kind of angling up towards the ceiling. So you're kind of looking at this mirror and seeing the ceiling height. You can paint your ceiling height a light color. That generally lifts the perception. Because a lot of, with a lot of these techniques, it's not so much necessarily that it's a literal representation of the what's called prime. It's that it, it evokes the idea of it's the perception of space. Um, but, okay, you can't raise your ceiling height, uh, you can't enlarge your space, but how about artwork? How about putting up a uh, poster of a landscape or a photograph of a landscape which suggests deep space, which suggests space receding in depth? Just that image, again, has been found to trigger the same kind of mindset that having a large space uh, would do unto itself. Hmm. It's great we can trick our minds uh it, it just kind of cracks me up in some ways it's like we're we're sort of making this up but then there is this evolution piece that we have to attend to to yeah. exactly and you know at the end of the day it is all in our minds it's not so much what is out there but what how we perceive what is out there to be mm -hmm. yeah now in your book you talked about um these three a's that are helpful uh to to adjust your space. Can you talk about the three A's and we can get into depth with some of those? 
Sure. So I mentioned the word prime a moment ago. So a prime is an input, right? Something that comes into our consciousness through one of the five senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, where it then triggers some kind of change of condition and output, change of behavior. So what we're talking about, of course, are all the inputs that research has discovered prompts or triggers an increase in creative thinking abilities. So having found these kind of 48 different techniques, what I discovered as well, that's a lot of techniques here. How do I give them some kind of form? How do I give them some kind of gestalt? And what I uh, found most helpful is to kind of subdivide them into three groups. And they all start with the letter A, because nice. that's a nice mnemonic <laughs> way of remembering things. So the first group of primes of what I call design triggers or inputs, they all mean the same thing are labeled appearances and appurtenances, right? So these are all primes that you see in your physical surroundings, whether they are embedded in the construction, the walls, the floors, the ceilings, the built-ins, or in the stuff that moves around and, and, and occupies that space, the appurtenances. So furnishings, artwork, decorative objects, things of that nature. The second group I call the ambience tactics because these are primes that are more diffuse, less tangible. So we could be talking about lighting, we could be talking about sound, we could be talking about scent even, temperature, things of those sorts. And then the last group I call the action tactics because these are things that people do that scientists have discovered uh, bring forth a more creative mindset. But of course, knowing what those are, you can begin to program your workspace, program your workplace, your office, as well as home to encourage these kinds of activities to happen. Nice. So we've talked about already about a few of the appearances, um, the mirrors, the vertical stripes, Let's talk a bit about some of the ambient, something in the ambient category, and then later in the action tactics. So, what's something ambient-wise that uh, we, a change we can make to be more creative? Well, interestingly, I think you know this is where uh, research is really helpful because it sometimes contradicts the sort of common wisdom, the conventional conventional thinking. So, I think if you walk down the street and ask folks, you know, so what's your ideal noise level when you're trying to do creative work? I think most people will probably intuitively say, "Oh, well, quiet, of course, isn't that necessarily the best?" Well, here's where science would suggest otherwise. What they have found is that a sound level, a noise level of about 70 decibels, is like the sweet spot where people are at their kind of creative peak. So 70 decibels, just to kind of give you a reference point, if you walk into your local coffee shop on a kind of moderately busy day and people are chattering and then the glasses are clinking and all of that sort of thing, that's roughly about 70 decibels, which might be why, of course, creatives love to hang out in Starbucks and coffee shops and do their thing all day long. So I, a couple of caveats here. One, this has to be white noise, right? So that's unintelligible background noise. It can be the chatter in a restaurant, but it could also be crashing waves or the rustling of leaves and trees when the wind is blowing, crickets even, shower, the sound of a shower is about 70 decibels of white noise because you don't want to focus on what that sound is. So the Pe right. The thing people say in the workplace is most distracting is somebody having a conversation next to them on the phone where they're getting that one-sided, I can hear every word and it drives <laughs> people crazy. Yeah. So it has to be white noise. But the, the idea here is that that bit of background chatter or noise is just enough to kind of take the edge off of your focus because focus is about analytical thinking, right? When you're mm -hmm. doing heads down work and you really got to focus on what you're doing and concentrate and that pay total attention to what you're doing. So let's say you're going through some financial statements or something that really requires analytical thinking. You want pure focus. Whereas when you're in a creative mode, you know, you want to be a little dreamy. You want to let your mind wander, knock around crazy ideas, not be so concentrated and narrow in your thinking, getting back to that openness idea of, again, opening your mind to different uh, approaches to things. This is really interesting. Have you heard of the, uh, the app called Focus at Will? I have not, but tell me about it. So it's a it's a music app or a music website, I guess. And basically what it is, is there's all these different channels that you can select from. You play this music and it's intentionally designed to not engage you. Uh, it, I think it's really about having this background white noise. And one of them is the crowded coffee shop. And you can just uh, right. play the crowded coffee shop in your office, you know, or in your headphones, whatever. Uh, but there, there's other ones too, but they talk about how most music is designed to engage you and to pull you in, which makes sense, but that's not necessarily helpful when you're trying to either focus or maybe focus creatively. 
Exactly. So music is its own special class of sound uh, as opposed to white noise. And yes, the general guidelines for that is if you want to you know, encourage peak performance, make it, first of all, instrumental, mm -hmm. not with lyrics. If you do do lyrics, make it as familiar to yourself as possible. So it's like almost recedes into the background. Uh, certainly it has to be music or should be music that you like. Um, generally dissonant sounds, you know, non-melodic sounds are a downer. Or so we kind of steer clear of this. So there's certain guidelines with music, but um, it, it definitely can boost creativity when it's kind of done in the right way. By the way, there's another app that's just coming to mind called Coffativity, which is also that, oh, you need a um, coffee shop in your home office where there's nobody but you play this as background. But they also have cricket sounds and the rush crashing waves and all that kind of cool stuff. So yes, you can make your own background noise. Nice. Yeah. Particularly helpful if you are stuck in your cubicle or at work <laughs> and you can't leave for some reason and you can just put those on your headphones. The headphones on. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Uh, all right. So that sounds like a, a pretty realistic, easy way to change the ambient uh, environment. What are, what's an action tactic or two that you would recommend that people use? Well, lots of good ones. Um, Certainly, sleeping and napping are uh, classic examples of things people can do to kind of bring out ideas. Because what's happening is, rather than being unconscious when we're sleeping and napping, our brains are actually working just almost as hard as they are when you are awake. And in fact, with creative thinking, it's uh, very helpful to have this kind of incubation period or this consolidation period where things you've been working on or thinking about are allowed to kind of churn without having that intermediary conscious awareness of wakeness. So that's why, of course, there are great stories about people waking up with the Eureka moment. Uh, classic is Paul McCartney wakes up and he gets the whole melody for yesterday in his mind, rushes to the table, writes it all out, and there it is, all done while you're sleeping. So uh, during the workday, certainly, you know, we used to think that uh, sleeping on the job was a bad thing. Uh, not so much. Uh, nowadays, um, more and more organizations certainly are encouraging people to actually take naps during the day. The kind of classic period is roughly 2 to 3 p.m. There's all, again, lots of guidelines. Don't do it for more than 20, 25 minutes and so on and so forth. But you see more and more nap rooms and facilities mm -hmm. and workplaces. And of course, at home, it's your home. So you can go off and take a nap. But take a break, restore some of that brain power, and possibly come up with uh, new ideas as well. Yeah, I love it. I've definitely used that. I I have found that if I'm really stuck and trying to figure something out, especially if it is in the afternoon and I'm tired, then I'll go take a nap. But I'll do it intentionally where I'm like, okay, I'm going to specifically nap on this problem. And I'll lay down on the couch and I'll just, you know, close my eyes. And I don't know if I'd fall asleep per se, but... I definitely drift off. And then, I mean, nine times out of 10, I wake up and the problem's solved. I'm like, okay, I'm good. And I go back to work and I implement. And it's pretty cool, actually. It's great stuff. So you are following in the footsteps of no less than Thomas Edison, <laughs> who had his own methodology. So he would sit in a comfortable chair in the afternoon or whatever, and he would hold like three, four ball bearings, basically oh, these yeah. metal spheres in his hand. And he would start thinking about a problem, which by the way, is a great technique. And same with when you're going to sleep at night, think about that problem you've been working on just before you go to sleep, just before you nap, as you say, it can lead to some interesting outcomes. But anyway, what uh, Thomas Edison, he would start to nod off. And of course, his hand would kind of fall down towards the floor. The ball bearings would clatter onto the hard floor and it would wake him up. And he would you know, immediately think about what he had just been contemplating before he dozed off. Because you're in this you know, here's the thing about creativity. A lot of it is happening below the level of consciousness, of mm -hmm. course, just yeah. at that threshold, that kind of a little bit unconscious, a little bit conscious. So the more you can kind of dip into that, but still capture it, the better. That's awesome. Yeah. It's fun to hear the techniques of people, you know, like Edison and Einstein and those others that are uh, really the giants in the world of creativity. Um One other thing I want to ask before we get into uh, looking at the space here. You mentioned uh, some research in your book, a theory called prospect refuge theory. And can you talk a little bit about that? I want to bring some of that research in here. Sure. So prospect refuge theory ties into what we talked about uh, towards the beginning, uh, which is the idea that we are genetically encoded. We are bioengineered, wired, if we were, to seek out vantage points in space, habitats that provide 
maximum prospect, meaning kind of view, right? So what is that? That's basically a 180 degree sweep from left to right, because that's pretty much all our heads can rotate. But at the same time, uh, afford that sense of protection I was talking about. So a wall or a forest or rocks behind you, your flanks and maybe overhanging branches uh, above you to kind of protect you from the potential of what was back in the day, of course, literal harm from hostile tribes or predator animals and so forth. So again, because evolution uh, kind of weeds out the weak and, and, and allows those the fittest to survive, those who figure that out were the ones who, of course, uh, bequeathed their genes to subsequent generations until we are to the point where all of us are, in a sense, wired to seek out these vantage points. So that could be, where do you put a home? Well, you know, we all have that dream of having that mountaintop villa that kind of looks out over the valley and you get that sweeping view, but you're in an elevated position, so it's hard to get to. That dream is coming from, in a sense, our mm -hmm. DNA, our inherited uh, uh, mindset but so too in interior space as well that's why i kind of recommend people turn their desk around so they face their space look into the room see the point of entry have the walls or cabinets or screening element behind you and so forth because that will lead to that sense of relaxation which is generally how you want to be when you're engaged in creative work relax not feeling threatened not feeling stressed because as soon as you do you're going to move into that self-preservation analytical left brain mindset mm -hmm. And stress does not help creativity. Uh, it kills it, actually. That's <laughs> yeah. the number one creativity killer is stress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've definitely seen that in my own life. You know, at times when I've been stressed, not, not so much in a moment, but if I think of a period, like say over a week or even longer, uh, yeah, it's not very creative. No, no. You want to be, look, because creativity is a kind of risk-taking venture, right? If you propose something that no one's ever done before you're kind of holding yourself out to criticism ridicule whatever certainly in a workplace environment people are very hesitant to go out on a limb because oh my god if they think i'm crazy they're gonna not promote me or i'm not gonna be advanced or whatever so it's a risky adventure you have to feel like you're in a safe space mm -hmm. which is why our homes tend to be the place where we do get more creative ideas than anywhere else because that is our kind of uh, safe harbor right that's mm -hmm. where we feel freest where we have the greatest amount of autonomy and kind of self-control and so forth all of these things are critical in a climate in a in workplace culture to really bring out the creative best in folks mm -hmm. yeah so you're we're more creative in our houses in our homes than we are in our offices which <laughs> may be disappointing to some employers no, but it does start to give us some cues on what we can do in the workplace uh, to improve creative output. And interestingly, I'm kind of getting into it now. There's a whole field called, uh, hold on to your hat, where this term, resimercial design, right? So what does that sound like? Residential plus commercial, a kind of hybrid approach, approach to workplace design where they're bringing in more elements from home than have traditionally been the case. You now see offices with fireplaces in them, just something you would not have seen, certainly for the last 50, 60 years. Yeah. I've talked about nap rooms and comfortable seating and all of these things that evoke home, but are obviously in a work environment to kind of find that happy medium between the two that uh, the evidence certainly suggests will increase uh, group creativity as well. Yeah, nice. I love it. What is it? Resi Merschel? Resi Merschel. <laughs> Horrible great. word, I have to say. <laughs> I, I'm going to hold a contest and try to find, you know, give the winner a big prize to come up with a better term. But until we have one, that's unfortunately where we where we have to be. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. All right, so let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit and look at my office. I know you and I have talked about this before the podcast. Um, and for those of you who are listening listening via audio, uh, this is also available on YouTube, so you can see the images of my space. And Donald has offered to give me some feedback on the space to help me think about how I might, what changes I might make to increase my creativity. So I'm going to do- Free of it. charge, I should mention. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so generous of you, Donald. <laughs> my pleasure. All right. So um, you can, I know you've looked at these before and you've also seen a video of the space. Uh, do you want me to walk through them again or what's helpful for you? Uh, you know, we could start at the top and just kind of see where things go. So I'm looking uh, at the shot of your desk now. It's almost like we're standing. We've just come through the door uh, mm -hmm. into the space and we're kind of standing in the midst of the room and we're looking towards your desk, a window and the kind of left there, right? Mm -hmm. Is everybody exactly. seeing that? 
Okay, so here we are, of course, talking about that issue of prospect refuge, habitat theory, and so forth. The idea that you want to face into your space rather than to a wall because that's compressing our kind of mental space uh, by having such a shallow depth between you and the wall. But I understand there are technical issues here. You know, people have monitors, they have things on the wall that they need to access. So, you know, with all of these, you don't have to, you know, have to implement every technique and there are many things you can do to complement or offset where you're not able to implement the ideal scenarios but in your case you know one option is just turn that desk 90 degrees mm -hmm. and have your bookcases etc behind you it's very easy to get to by just turning around and so forth mm -hmm. you're then looking into the room you you have a particular benefit because your window is right there and what i see through the window are leaves on trees so this brings in a whole group of techniques which are tied to nature so right we talked about how we are kind of rooted in a natural environment that we are most uh, comfortable and at ease in nature rather than in built structures but having that kind of visible access to leaves and greenery, all of this has been found again and again to boost creativity. Uh, I think I can uh, imagine, a, I recall one study where simply by putting plants in a workplace environment, they boosted idea generation as much as 40%. So these wow. are real measurable, tangible differences here. We're not just talking kind of woohoo and it's all in our minds or anything of that sort. Um, another thing uh, we could talk about and maybe uh, do you have a shot across the, as if you're sitting at the desk and looking to the wall to the left now? I think you have like a, yeah, whiteboard wall or, or oh, some yeah, kind of inscribable surface there. This. So there you go. So if you turn your desk around, which by the way, gives you a nice great shot to the entry door into the space. And, and this is one for folks who are listening who might be adherents of feng shui. There are a few points of overlap between the scientific research and feng shui, which of course is a pretty scientific kind of tradition of space making, but they're very strong on the whole idea of seeing the point of entry into the room, what they call a commanding position of the space, taking a commanding position of the space, which is to say you can see it. Um, but uh, what I was going to talk about here is if you turn your desk 90 degrees, you'd be facing this wall, you know, primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, how about painting that a color? Mm -hmm. um, there are two colors that the research shows boost creativity when people are primed, exposed to it. One is blue and the other is green. And I think you can obviously tell where green is coming from. It is nature. Uh, just again, that kind of metaphorical representation of nature, non-literal representation of nature still has that priming effect. So if you paint it even just as a color wall, an accent wall, mm -hmm. meaning just that one wall, you don't know, can leave the other three white and then remount, obviously, your, your board and your, mm -hmm. and your materials. That would be a plus. I do love the fact that you are using what's called what I call in the book a working wall right you're mm -hmm. using your wall as an idea space mm -hmm. by having you know large drawing surface and so forth you can first of all externalize your creative ideas uh, which is very important right get them out of your head and into the world because you're going to forget them within 10 to 15 seconds otherwise you can develop those ideas at a larger scale right on a whiteboard wall or the kind of marker wall and no, folks, you don't have to be, you know, great draftsmen or, or artists in the sense of being able to draw. We think visually, creative uh, idea generation is primarily visual, so get it out there, but make it big. You know, you want to think big, draw big is what I say. So that's another possibility. Um, I like the easy chair. This mm -hmm. ties into a tactic, which I call lie down or recline, because what they find is that our posture matters you know, sitting in the chair, and we all know that kind of sitting is the new smoking. We've all heard that, and it ties into our health, which again ties into creativity. But lying down and reclining actually can boost your uh, idea um, formation by a considerable amount because when we lie down, and this ties into our neurobiology, that little piece of our brain called the locus ceruleus goes into deactivation mode. And it makes us more relaxed and laid back, literally, which we talked about as being kind of an optimal state of mind for creative thinking. Whereas as soon as you are kind of prompted to stand up, it kicks in what's called noradrenaline, norepinephrine, those are two substances, same name, uh, same thing with different names, which make us more alert, more analytic, more left brain. So lie down, relax tells your brain, tells your body that you're in a comfortable space and the ideas will flow that much more readily. Hmm. That's great. Yeah, I definitely find myself maybe just intuitively feeling, because I have a stand-up desk, so 
I tend to write emails or respond in to maybe I guess more analytical work you could say, but there's a certain point in the day where I almost always sit down and I almost think of it as I'm, I'm thinking more. In fact, I have this table here that I've kind of dubbed like my thinking table mm. that I'll just sit at it and I can spread books out and stuff and uh, tends to be a place where I do more writing. I don't know if that's uh, if there's any research backing that in particular, but... Yeah, definitely. Um, this is all good. Um, yeah, you know, uh, if you have the luxury of kind of subdividing your space, you can literally designate certain areas for heads down analytic work. You can designate other spaces for uh, creative work. And that's great that you have this table because what happens is our brains associate place with activity. Mm -hmm. So by coming to the same place again and again and again to do your creative work, it's almost like Pavlov's dogs, right? And after being fed, you know, a dozen times and ringing a bell, you, the dog started salivating just from the sound of the bell without any of the food around. So we too have a certain associationism going on when we uh, link ourselves to a particular activity, to a particular space. Mm -hmm. Great example of that, by the way, um, Charles Dickens, right? Great writer. Uh, he would do a lot of book tours. He came to America at some point in the 19th century. And what he would do is, uh, first of all, rearrange the furniture in his hotel room to more closely resemble his studio, but his, his study <laughs> nice. back in England. And he would also bring little tchotchkes, little decorative objects from his table, his desk back in England with him so that all of this would kind of evoke the home environment, his work, his creative work environment, even though he was away from his uh, traditional creative space. I love it. That's awesome. Well, this is great. Thank you so much for the feedback. I'm definitely going to turn my desk 90 degrees for sure. That's just a really easy change. I'm going to go do that as soon as we get off the phone or off the, off the call here. Yeah, we like those kind of changes because they cost absolutely nothing, <laughs> as you say, and that's great. And even just low cost, you know, uh, improvements can, can make a big, big difference as well. Mm-hmm. So Donald, as we wrap up, uh, I always like to end with giving listeners a weekly challenge, something that they can do this week to apply something that you talked about, something that they learned. So what would you recommend that listeners do for a weekly challenge? Well, I think the first thing to do is to kind of assess your own space and to really ask yourself, you know, what works about this space, what doesn't work about this space. And that's not always easy to do because you kind of have to reflect on your own kind of mental processing, um, but really try to kind of keep maybe a log or create a report as to say, you know, I don't think I'm doing my best when I do this or as you would, you know, perhaps discover when I go to this table, I'm doing my best work. Why is that the case? And then create a second column and say, okay, where are my weak points and what can I do to, you know, improve them? What, maybe just make some changes and see how they come out and then, you know, dig into it. Awesome. And Donald, if people want to learn more about you and your work or get your book, where can they find that info? Well, the book is at all the usual suspected online dealers, your Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, Books a Million. I hope it's also in your bookstore as well. If not, ask them for it. Uh, and you can find out more about me at Donald Ratner, and that's Ratner with two T's, very important because there are some one T Ratners floating around, but that's <laughs> not my, my clan, donaldratner.com. Excellent. Thank you so much for being on the show, Donald, and sharing so much with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for having me. Great advice from Donald. I love it. I love the practical nature of what he's talking about, of, but bringing in the research. And that's something that I really feel like is so important in the world of creativity because there's kind of a lot of fluff out there. And when we can tie it back to research and say, hey, but here's what we found. This is actually, I dare say, fact. <laughs> uh, but this is what the research is saying about space or about anything related to creativity. I think is super important. So I really appreciate that about Donald, that he's taking this research and he's making it practical so we can apply it to our everyday lives. So as you can see behind me, if you're watching on the video, I made some changes after our interview. And I want to just walk you through the changes. The first thing I did, which you can already see if you saw, if you're watching the video, is I turned my desk 90 degrees. So now behind me is a bookshelf, um, which means that the door to my office is now at a 45 degree angle from where I'm standing. I have a stand-up desk. 
So I can see anybody that comes in, there's actually a window in the door so I can see if you know somebody pokes their head in, my wife or a client is coming in, uh, I, I'm able to see that, which I guess apparently is going to help me feel less stressed. And, and I've, I've had this set up for a little while now and I actually really like it, it's great. It also means that in the other direction, 45 or not quite 45, but is the window and on the windowsill there are potted plants so giving me some greenery there and then out the window, I can see a big trees. I live in a fairly uh, wooded area, wooded neighborhood, so that's nice. Behind me, there's also some natural light coming in. Also from my desk, there's a wall that I can touch. It's a, just you know an arm's length away. And I have turned that wall into a working space as well as an inspiration space. So let me show you for those of you on the video. On the wall, I have a Kanban board where I can track projects, what I'm working on, what I need to do, as well as some inspiration. There's a, uh, you know, some goals that I put up, some magazine images to help me feel inspired and focused. And then on the far side of the room, I've actually added these big flip chart papers of a calendar. So February through May, four months so I can see kind of what's happening, what are the events going on that I'm doing and help me stay motivated without having too much input. And you can see if I'm standing at my desk, here's my monitor and there's the door. Uh, so I've made quite a few changes in the office since I worked with Donald. And I'm really enjoying it. I love it. So there's still some more changes to make. I haven't done the colored wall. I think if anything, I would probably paint it blue rather than green. I just feel an affinity more towards that color. And in fact, I was happy to hear him say blue also would work because I, I don't know if you noticed, but behind him was just a wall of green. He painted all his cabinets green. And I know that he did that after he did the research. He figured, hey, I better apply what I'm learning, right? Uh, which I thought was pretty cool. So some ideas, I hope this is helpful for you to think about what changes you might be able to make in your own work, in your own space to be more creative. I would love to see some pictures, post them online, tag me at Amy Clymer. You can also tag Donald as well. We would love to see what changes you make after listening to the episode. Have a wonderful week. Bye everyone. Thanks for listening to the Deliberate Creative Podcast. Listen to more episodes and learn more about creativity, leadership, and teams at climberconsulting.com.